So we've sung some really good hymns this morning. A lot of it's got to do with uh, salvation and the purchase price that Christ uh, purchased our salvation. It's his death on the cross. That we have no eternal life apart from Christ. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And uh, so we've sung some great hymns, some great words that were penned by the, uh, what do you call them, hymnists, uh, hymnologists, whatever. Um, so, and we, we agree with those words. And of course, we match them up with the Bible. And a lot of those words which were penned from uh, those hymn writers were penned from the heart or personal experiences that they had with the Lord. And so um, we, we appreciate those hymns that were penned. So this morning then, we're going to look at this theme of forgiveness and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. Uh, he died on the cross. He forgave us our sin. And uh, I mean, that's, that's what Christ does and has done on the cross. But does, does that mean that everybody is saved and obviously I've read the end of the book and everybody is not saved. Does that mean that Christ needs to come and die again or die daily? Does he need to come uh, come again to die for every single person that has come to the Lord Jesus Christ and he has to die? No, he did it once for all. It's, the book of Hebrews is a fantastic, fantastic book and I urge you to read it and um, written by Paul and a very, very in-depth theologian comparing the sacrifices of the Old Testament with Christ's sacrifice. And it's so, so, uh, such a great book. Um, I urge you to read it. I, I, I just love it. And um, so uh, please, if you have, well, if you have time, make time to read it. Make time to read it. And keep in mind that the comparison with the Old Testament and the New um, is, is uh, so, so clearly distinguished in Christ. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to look at this forgiveness, or as I've named it, pressing on under Christ's forgiveness. Let's pray. Now, if I were to ask uh, Christians around the globe, right, I was going to do a uh, ask all the Christians, so I'm not going to take a sample, I'm, I'm going to take a, a global view of people. And I'm going to ask them, do you know John 3.16? How many do you think would know John 3.16? I'd say just about 100% of all Christians would know John 3.16. John 3.17, maybe not. And that's where I've, I've come to, or, or am starting to use this passage here, looking at forgiveness, because this is where forgiveness is centered. The forgiveness is centered in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's centered, the forgiveness is centered in love. In the love of God for his creation. And so we look at verse 17. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, all of a sudden... You know, when we forgive somebody or are able to forgive someone, do we put stipulations on it? I will forgive you if you do this. I will forgive you if you do this. Is that true forgiveness? Is that agape love or self-sacrificing love? I will only forgive you if you apologize. Or uh, I... I will apologize to you, but it's up to you to forgive me or not. Or do we expect when we apologize that people forgive? And so that's what we're uh, going to be looking at this morning, comparing the word forgiveness and how it's taught in Scripture, and how it's taught in Scripture. Because obviously there is something that is needful or needs to happen before before forgiveness can take place, scripturally speaking, okay, scripturally speaking. Otherwise, why did God, Christ have to die on the cross? He could have just said, I forgive everybody. 
And it doesn't matter if, if you're sorry or not, I forgive you. Does that mean that we're all Christians? When Christ died on the cross, he died for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for everyone. Not just that in verse 17, for God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the questions that, that ran through my mind and uh, may be running through your mind, what does the word forgiveness actually mean? What does the word forgiveness actually mean? Is the meaning of the word forgiveness today the same as the word forgiveness as we see in Scripture? Does forgiveness, how does forgiveness come about? Do I have to expect or do I expect an apology or can I forgive someone regardless of receiving an apology or not? So, for example, we, we see in the newspaper or see on, on TV um, where someone has lost a loved one, has been murdered or been raped or something, some bad thing has happened, and you see the mother and the father or even the, the person, if they've been raped, saying, I forgive that person for doing that. Because they didn't know what they were doing or for whatever reason, because of their past, or whatever, I forgive that person. Even though that person may not apologize. So how does forgiveness come about? How do I receive forgiveness? How do I give forgiveness? How does the Bible speak about forgiveness? How does it come about? Well, obviously in John 3.16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we'll look at a little bit more about that because is that a sort of a conditional forgiveness? And what sort of forgiveness is that if it has to be conditional? Is that forgiveness? I forgive you only if you do this. Is that true forgiveness? Or is there something more that I'm missing here about the word forgiveness? So how does forgiveness come about? Does anything need to happen before forgiveness can be received? Does anything need to happen before forgiveness can be received? So, for example, I forgive you, but there's no remorse, nothing. So really, has forgiveness taken place in that person's life? You may forgive them, but... They haven't forgiven themselves, put it that way, maybe. Or they don't see that they need to be forgiven. So therefore the application of forgiveness, even though I've given it, hasn't been given or changed the person's life. Do you see where I'm going with this? I'm trying to establish the word forgiveness here. Because in the world today, I can forgive, you know, for, for example, I can forgive Croydon. For being so tall and difficult to baptize. I can forgive him for that. But you see, he doesn't think there's a necessary to be forgiven because he is this tall, and, and really, that's my problem, not his. Okay? We could have st stood closer to the edge and, and all those sort of things. I remember when I was baptizing Adrian Kursop, um, and he's a tall man. I had his head on the edge of the, the, the baptismal. Oh, that was back in, in Pages Road, baptismal pool. But so if he doesn't see the need for forgiveness, what's the point of that? So it only applies to me and not to him. I can forgive him, but he doesn't accept my forgiveness in the sense that he doesn't see that forgiveness is necessary. Okay, so there's a, the two-way thing that is happening here. Okay, and which is very important when we look at the Bible because there's a two way thing that needs to happen, and we'll look at that uh, as well. We won't probably get to it this week, but we'll get to it next week. So, what is the definition then of forgive? So, what does forgiveness actually mean? What is the definition of forgiveness? So, what you do is when you want a definition, what do you do? Okay, I did both. 
I went to the dictionary and then I googled it. Okay, so w firstly from the dictionary, forgive is a verb, so it's an action. I'm going to forgive you. It's an action. Okay, that is applied from you to someone else or from someone else to you. Okay, it's a verb. It's an action. If you go to the online dictionary, it says, no longer feel angry about. So in other words, this is an application to self. Right? So you're not feeling angry about something that has happened. It doesn't matter about the other person, whether they're forgiven or not. Or a wish to punish. Uh, to cancel a debt. To cancel a debt. So, for example, if um, someone had um, broken into your house and stolen your TV, or actually, make it more important, stolen your cell phone, and you know you can't live without a cell phone for a day, 12 hours, 24 hours, you know, it's terrible. You can't live without them, right? You're, you're not even in contact with anybody if you don't have a cell phone, right? So if someone stole your cell phone, you forgive them for doing that, and you cancel the debt. Don't worry about giving me my cell phone back. There's no punishment. I'm not going to report it to the police. That's canceling the debt that they owe you, and the, and the, the punishment, right? Webster's Dictionary says, to pardon, to remit as an offence or debt, to overlook an offence, and to treat the offender as not guilty. In other words, if I were to forgive someone, I'm treating them as though they're not guilty. Or I have pardoned them and said they are not guilty. Even though they've committed a crime. Or have offended you in some way. Or have hurt you in some way. Okay? To pardon, to remit as an offence or debt, to overlook an offence and treat the offender as not guilty. Now notice, it's one way. Right? It's nothing to do with the receiver. Nothing at the moment to do with the receiver. So Christ can forgive you your sins. So that's what he's done. But it's nothing to do with the receiver. How do you receive that? How do you receive that forgiveness of sins? Um, the original and proper phrase is to forgive the offence, to send it away, to reject it, that is, not to impute it, put it to the offender, or not to put it to the offender, to put it away. Okay? And the dictionary goes on to say, but by an easy transition... We also use the phrase to forgive the person offended. So in other words, we lump the word forgiveness into all those ideas. Like sending the, the offense away. And we'll look at a couple of Bible verses in a moment to do with that. With that. So the definitions are interesting. I thought they were interesting because some of them, the older dictionaries... The 1800 Webster's Dictionary, which I have online, well not online, it's on my Bible program, gives me that definition we've seen. And interesting because to forgive means to send the offence away and to treat the offender as not guilty. Treat the offender as not guilty. So when Christ died on the cross and he forgives us our sins, does he treat us as being not guilty? Does that mean everybody's saved? You see, this is, this is what I've been struggling with because now we see that not everybody is saved and yet Christ died for the whole world. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So if Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of man's sins then why aren't we all forgiven and all Christians? Is everybody saved? No. Does it mean that we have to do something to be saved? 
Well, we'll come to that. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. Okay? Just be careful with that. So forgiveness is applied to the offense and not the person. Notice that. Forgiveness is applied to the offense and not the person. We try to lump it all together. And so when Christ died on the cross, he forgave the offense of sin. It's not applied to the person yet. Okay? So when Christ died, all of sin was forgiven. Right? Let us turn to Psalm 103. So these are the two passages that I wanted to look at. So this is the first one. So turn with me to Psalm just to keep you awake, I know it's really hot, and it's really hot up here, and I wish I had a little fan that would blow up my trouser legs, right up to my armpits. Uh, in fact, what I'll do is I'll stick these under here, because I feel like I'm dry. <laughs> Norman says I should put them right under my armpit, and then take it out to blow my nose. <laughs> I don't know, would that work? Uh, the hankies be too wet. Um, but boy, it's warm up here. I tell you, it's warm you know, it's up here. No, it's warm up here. So Psalm 103, verse 12. Getting back to all seriousness now. Verse 12. Now, remember what we're talking about here. The, the definition of forgiveness is to do with the offense and not the offender. Not the person, but the offense. Now, if you look at verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So the transgressions or the sins he has removed from us. And there's a separation of the transgressions, which def goes with the definition that we've uh, looked at, okay? The def definition is interesting because to forgive means to send the offense away. To send the offense away. So when you forgive, you're forgiving the offense or the thing that has happened. And here, biblically speaking, this ties in with the def definition really good. It says, as far as the east is from the west, which is how far? Well, if you have a flat earth, it's an infinite distance. If you have a globe, it just meets, isn't it? East meets west. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to go down that road. Verse 12. So as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So he's removed our transgressions. Okay. Turn to Hebrews. Hebrews. Chapter 8, verse 12. <clears throat> now it's very difficult, obviously, to separate man from their behavior, right? But this is what God does in his forgiveness. Okay? It says here, verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. It doesn't say I'll be merciful to them. It says their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. There is a separation or a division or a sending away as the definition of forgiveness is. A sending away of the iniquity is what, what the definition goes on to say. Okay? Now turn over one more to Hebrews chapter 10 down to verse 17. <clears throat> So it's the same as what we've just read, just a condensed form. 
It says, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, when you forgive someone, can you can you remember the sins no more? Oh, you bring it up. Yeah, bring it up. <laughs> yeah, remember the time. Okay. I forgave you. Now you're not forgiving me. Remember the time. I'm not afraid of your fault. So forgiveness is applied to the offence. So when you look at scripture, the offence or forgiveness is applied to the offence and not the person. Okay? So Christ died on the cross and he died for all man's sin. Okay? He died for their sin because the wages of sin is death. So he paid the penalty for the sin. Right? Do you see the definitions at work in these verses that we just looked at? Do you see the definition? And yet there's, there's still a, a bit of cloudiness here when, because the English language or the English that we use today changes or lumps meanings together. So we have a meaning that if I said that I'm gay, you would say, oh, really? Why are you pastor? Or, I'm glad you're happy. See, there's a difference in meanings that, that are happening. So, the definitions then, we can clearly distinguish between the sin and the sinner. Because there's a separation or a sending away of sin, leaving the sinner. Okay? That is why forgiveness is closely aligned with being justified. Justified had not sinned. So once my sin has gone, then that leaves me sinless because God doesn't remember them anymore. He's moved them as far as the east is from the west. And so therefore, it's just as if I hadn't sinned. That I'm justified. The penalty has been paid. Christ paid the price for sin on the cross. The wage of sin is death. And he is the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so um, God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. So what he does, he separates the sin from the sinner. No, because he loves you, because he loves you, he separates that sin from the sinner. <clears throat> okay, let's carry on. Another interesting point is that forgiveness can be given, but not necessarily received. Okay, I can forgive him, but he doesn't receive it. He's still angry at me. You know, or, you know, he doesn't accept it or you know he can forgive me but I don't accept it it needs to be a two way thing but we oh there's my hanky get back up here no, boy it's hot up here um, so so not necessarily received, yet still valid, regardless if sin is admitted or forgiveness asked for. So if I forgive Rick, whether or not he receives that forgiveness or not, it's still a valid forgiveness. And of, of, oftentimes you go to counselling, if you need some counselling, and they say the first step is to forgive yourself. To forgive yourself. Or to forgive others. Because if you don't, it eats up, eats up in, you, in yourself and, and you get all churned up and all that sort of anger and, and things like that that happen. So it's still valid forgiveness. If I were to forgive Rick, and even whether or not he accepts it or not, it's still valid. So when Christ died on the cross, he forgave every man and whether it's accepted or not, it's still a valid, valid Forgiveness. Similarly, forgiveness can be asked for, but not necessarily given. 
So you might apologise to someone. But, a, but forgiveness may not be given. So forgive me for the wrong that I've committed. And you see that on TV too, don't you? When people have been done wrong or wrong to their family and these people read out their statement of apology or them, it might be a sincere one. I'm not saying that they are all insincere statements that they make in, in a courtroom or, the, or the, the, the effects that it has on a person and they're apologising. A lot of times that the <coughs> forgiveness isn't given. Forgive me for the wrong I have committed. No. I'm not going to forgive you. It's unforgivable. It's unforgivable. So, forgiveness can be asked for, but not necessarily given. That is, you can withhold forgiveness, even though the person who has sinned has asked for forgiveness. Now, does God do that? And I put it to you, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. And we'll look at biblically um, soon. We'll, we'll try and tie things together. Not, not this morning, but we'll tie things together over the next week or so. Okay? So, you can withhold forgiveness even though the person who has sinned has asked for forgiveness. So, humanly speaking, we can forgive others even though they don't want or see a need of forgiveness. And I, I can forgive anybody right but they don't see a need for forgiveness Christ when he died on the cross was it effective for all mankind or just for those that would believe now we don't want to get into the Calvinist tulip line where Christ died only for those that would believe a limited atonement because obviously when Christ died on the cross he died for all it's not a limited atonement. So humanly speaking, we can forgive others even though they don't want or see a need of forgiveness. Firstly, today's English is lumped forgive and remit. So come up here. Remit into one word, yet there are two words. So when we think about forgiveness, we lump the word remit and forgiveness together, just into one meaning. It's easier to, to remember one word than to remember two words, and yet they are two words, right? One word is forgiveness, and the other word is remit. So let's go to John chapter 20, just to wake you up again. John, John chapter 20. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And if you find John chapter 22, I suggest you buy another Bible. There's only one, 21 chapters. So John 20 verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Interesting verse of scripture. Because the word remit here, it's, it's not using the word forgive. Okay? It's not using the word forgive. Because obviously the word forgiveness is in the Bible, or the word forgive is in the Bible. But the word that's been used here is remit. Is remit. So there is a different meaning for remit because obviously this is not the Christian thing to do. You want to forgive everybody. As Christ forgave you, you want to forgive everybody. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So if we take it back into the context, here's the disciples, or the disciples, apostles, uh, whatever, they're going out. So in verse 21, they're being sent out. Then Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So the disciples, the apostles, are being sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 22, And he said 
uh, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Interesting. Does that mean that I can forgive because I've received the Holy Ghost? That I can remit sins? Whatever that means. Or not? Or not? And how does that differ with forgiveness? Why is the word remit here and not forgiveness? Because isn't that what some would do? You know, I forgive you, but or I won't forgive you, or I'm going to withhold forgiveness. So the word remit, according to Webster's Dictionary, it's always good to go to a dictionary and find the meaning of words. Okay, to surrender the right of punishing a crime. So here's the difference. So I can forgive someone for murder or for raping, but they still need to carry out the punishment of the crime. Right, if someone came into my house and burgled my house, I can forgive that burglar. But he still has to pay the penalty for the crime. So the word remit is to mean to surrender the right of punishing a crime. Now we're getting a better picture of what God means when he forgives sins, when he died on the cross, and not everybody is saved. We're starting to build up a picture of the word. And you need to be thinking about this this coming week. And turn it over in your own mind. And think about it yourself. If God is an all-forgiving God, why does some people go to hell and some people go to heaven? Why are all people saved? What is the difference when God forgives, doesn't he remove the sins as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more? And of course, here we see another word that comes into play, remit, which means to surrender the right of punishment. Now we all deserve punishment for sin, don't we? We're all sinners. We're all sinners, aren't we? Yes. yes, we're all sinners. Are we still sinning? Yeah. Yeah. Don't we deserve punishment for sin? The wage of sin is death? Don't we suffer that today in our bodies? Okay. And so, this is a very key thing. Surrendering the right of punishment. So a crime can be forgiven, but the punishment still exists. So we're sending away the, the crime or the, the sin, the iniquity, but the sinner is still here and the word remit is still available. And we'll, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail. This forgiveness can be followed up with remittance of that crime. That is punishment is surrendered. So the weight of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So death and eternal life means, the eternal life means that the death has been remitted. Otherwise you can never get eternal life. All right? But something needs to happen in between wage of sin's death and the gift of God. Eternal life, something has to happen in between. It's called the gift of God. The gift of God. How do we receive that gift? And why is there some people saved and others not saved? When Christ died for all. And that's what I want you to go away this morning and think about. And think about your privileged position that we are in Christ. The forgiveness that we received. 
by the death of Christ on the cross. We'll pick this up again next week and, um, and begin tying things together, biblically speaking. So what I'm trying to do is give you a better understanding of the word forgiveness as it applies in the Bible. Not as we would apply it, humanly speaking, but as the Bible applies it, as God would apply it. Apply. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Father, we thank you most of all for that forgiveness of sin. Father, we do pray that as we continue to meditate on that forgiveness and what that forgiveness means, Father, we do pray that we'll be drawn to your word and drawn closer to thee. Father, that you would speak to us and to continue to draw us closer and closer to thee. Father, what a privilege it is to know you as Lord and Saviour. What a privilege it is to know that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a privilege it is to know that absent from this body, we will spend eternity with thee. Father, what a privilege it is to know that you have gone to prepare a place for us, that where you are, we will also be. Father, we thank you, Lord, for a new body that you will give to us at the rapture. We thank you, Father, for the eternality of that body. No more sickness. Father, forever healthy. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. Father, we will walk the streets of gold. And Father, we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ because without his death, we would never, ever be able to enter into those places and to receive those gifts. We thank you, Father, for your word. We ask you, Father, to continue to lead and to guide us through your word. And Father, that we may indeed be blessed by it. Father, we do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.